This is hello, hello out there, hello. Hi again, everybody. A uh, few technical difficulties because I am back. I'm back on camera, and it's been so long. I practically forgot how to do it. I know you all miss seeing me so much. You're like, oh, thank God, it's her lovely face again. It's 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 well, it, it's my face at least, and it's it's here. Okay, so quick little video today. I keep saying that, and I, I keep having these long videos. I swear it's going to be a quick video. I, I prom I, well, I can't make that promise, but I really believe that it's going to be a quick little video. For sure. Today, I am going to delve into a single book and try to determine why that book is so popular. In this case, it is a classic book, and I'm going to try to figure out why it has endured for so long, over a hundred years, in fact, ever so long in the great scheme of things, it's not that long at all, but in the scheme of humanity, I guess. The book is A Little Princess, like you couldn't tell that by my title and thumbnail and intro. <clears throat> anyway, A Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett, my copy that I've had since I was a youth a long, 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 long time ago. Not quite as long as when this was first published, but still pretty long by this point. A Little Princess was first published mumble years ago. I don't have the exact date. I'll stick it in the bottom of the screen here. And of course, this doesn't say it says uh, 12th printing 1982 or something like that. So informative. But yes, 1982, a long time ago now, but it was about, what, 100 years since then, since this came out? So, still. And it's still popular since then. Really, relatively few things endure from year to year. And this is one of them. So, why? Why do we still like this one so much? Okay, so first off, I'm going to put the picture of the book up here so I don't have to keep holding it. First off... Let's look at the basic plot of the book. Right from the beginning, this first part, first chapter, first paragraph, first line, we have a foggy night in London town. There's a cab, you know, the old-fashioned cab is horse-drawn, with a little girl in it, and they're going somewhere. We don't know where. She's described as an odd little girl. She's staring out the window with an odd look on her face. We want to know why. Yeah, so right off the bat, this is a great start. It pulls us in. It makes us want to know more. It lends some mystery to the story. Now, in the first chapter, we learn that the little girl, Sarah Crew, is alone in the world except for her father, Captain Crew. The two are very close. They have a very loving relationship and very respectful of each other. Sarah is being deposited at Miss Minchin's boarding school. We meet Miss Minchin and her sister, Miss Amelia. Miss Minchin is established right off the bat as an antagonist to Sarah. They have very different personalities. Miss Minchin also has a very different personality from her sister. But we see that Miss Minchin has a much stronger personality. So although Miss Amelia may be sympathetic to Sarah, she will not be able to stand up for her. This sets up possible conflict down the road. Following this, we have Sarah establishing herself at the school, and in the process, we meet another antagonist, Lavinia, a fellow student who does not like Sarah. She thinks her odd, and of course, it all stems from jealousy. Lavinia and her friend Jessie are shown to be miniature versions of Miss Minchin and Miss Amelia. Jessie's very silly and really actually kind of likes Sarah. There's also the introduction of three girls who become Sarah's friends. There's Ermengarde, her fellow classmate, Lottie, another student who's younger and who Sarah acts as a big sister, or she calls it a mother, to her because Lottie doesn't have one. And there's also Becky. Now, Becky is a servant at the school, despite being Sarah's age. She, she is a servant, and Sarah befriends her, which makes Miss Minchin like her less because Miss Minchin has very definite ideas of class. So Sarah is shown to be a person with great sympathy for others because there's Lottie, who's littler, doesn't have a mother. There's Ermengarde, who has trouble with her studies. And there's Becky, who just simply was born into the wrong family. 
So soon enough, we have Sarah's birthday party. Now, Sarah's father has a great deal of money, and it is for this reason that Miss Minchin not only tolerates her, but showers her with what passes for affection from Miss Minchin. She takes charge of throwing her a lavish birthday party, and all sorts of presents arrive for Sarah. She has a French maid, etc. She could be very spoiled, but she is not. However, this is where things start going wrong for Sarah. In the midst of the birthday party, a lawyer arrives and takes Miss Minchin aside. It turns out that Sarah's father, he had left Sarah there while he went chasing a financial opportunity involving some diamond mines. Very dramatic sounding financial opportunity there. And it fell through. And the loss of it supposedly uh, was too much for him to bear. They say that he had a great fever, um, basically that he just had a breakdown and didn't recover from it, and he died. The loss of this financial opportunity means that all his finances went kaputski, and Sarah now has no money whatsoever. Money is about the only thing that endeared her to Miss Minchin, so now Miss Minchin is very not happy to have this penniless girl at her house that she is possibly expected to care for. So as a solution, she decides to make Sarah a servant like Becky. She sticks her in the attic where Becky also has to live. It is dirty, it is cold, there are rats up there. It is not a pleasant place, especially for a little girl. And this is a definite reversal of fortune for Sarah. It is hard for her to bear. Her friends, her real friends, show who they are. They are still very much on her side, and they make efforts to come to see her and try to cheer her up as much as they can. Sarah is shown here to be at her most human. She continually tries to help others and make their lives better, and she is always hopeful. But here, things have changed so much, and in such a drastic way, and she can't see a way out, that it is hard for her to deal with at first. However, the chapter where that happens, it doesn't even end on a low note, because her very nature will not allow her to be depressed for long. It is in this chapter that she meets Ram Das, who is also a servant. He is an Indian servant for a gentleman who has just moved into the building next door. He is up in their attic and looking out when he sees Sarah over in her attic, and he gets an idea of her situation and realizes things are really bad for her. They also have a monkey who <laughs> climbs out over the roof, and that's how they meet. He climbs over to Sarah's, and Ram Dass goes looking for the monkey, they exchange words, and things go from there. Things get a bit interesting and complicated and coincidental, which often you just couldn't do without in books, because how else would you move the plot along to where you want to? It, it, it happens often. Sarah gets sent out on errands a lot, and in the process of that, she continually walks past a large house containing what she calls the large family, because there are a lot of people in it, a lot of kids. And she uh, makes up stories about them. That's what she does. She makes up stories. She reads a lot. She uses her imagination, and it just and it is her imagination that helps her through her situation. She continually imagines that things are better. It's kind of like faking it until you make it. Putting on a smile until you're actually smiling for real. Now, it turns out that the father of that family is the lawyer for the gentleman who has moved next door to the school. They call him the Indian gentleman because he hails from India. He is in bad health and they never see him because he never leaves the house. It is the father of the large family being his lawyer who goes and does things for him as well as his servant Ram Dass. Now in the same chapter, we disconnect from Sarah and follow the father of the large family in to meet the Indian gentleman. As it turns out, in the biggest coincidence ever, but we love it because it just works so well for the plot, he turns out to have been the partner of Captain Crew. 
So he also was involved in the diamond mines, and and everything that happened with that affected him as well. However, he did not die. He just got really sick. Now, he feels guilty because it was kind of his fault, or he sees it that way, that Captain Crew got into this diamond mines thing in the first place. It was his idea, and he feels really guilty about the whole thing. So he has resolved that he is going to track down Captain Crew's little girl, and he knows she's alone in the world, so he is going to do his best to take care of her. And he has his lawyer out there looking everywhere for this little girl, traveling to different countries and just trying to track her down. So now we, the reader, know all this, but Sarah doesn't. Sarah hits another low point. She is out running errands. Everybody's been really awful to her all day, and she hasn't gotten anything to eat. So then a member of the large family, the little boy comes up to her, and he sees her and feels really sorry for her. So he gives her some money in order to buy some rolls. She gets the rolls, and she's all set to tuck in when she sees another little girl who's worse off than she is. And Sarah being Sarah, she just can't have that. So she gives the rolls to the little girl. The lady at the roll shop sees this and just can't believe it. And she's touched by this little girl who obviously needs these so badly, but is still giving them to somebody worse off than she is. That's the type of person Sarah is. While Sarah is out, we disconnect from her once more and move back into her attic. And we see things from the rat's perspective. There is a rat there that she has actually befriended. Again, Sarah being Sarah, she finds friends wherever she goes because she's kind. And she has named one of the rats Melchizedek, I believe is his name. We see it from his perspective. Ram Das and uh, a secretary of the gentleman next door come into the attic, look around, and are just depressed by the whole state of affairs, and they start making plans for how they how they can make this better for this sweet little girl. So again, we the audience know something that Sarah doesn't. And now we have probably Sarah's last low point. Miss Minchin finds out that Sarah's friends have been visiting her, and that they've been, you know, trying to use their imaginations to make to make it seem like it's a lovely place and things really aren't as bad as they appear. Well, she can't have that. Miserable people have got to be miserable. So she messes everything up, tells the girls they can't visit, etc. And then Sarah feels really alone. And she falls asleep very sad. But again, we the audience don't feel sad because we know something she doesn't. We are in on the secret. When she wakes up, the room is completely changed. There are all these beautiful things and everything is as it was in her imagination. This is the part that really hits our imaginations, our dreams, just thinking of that magic. Even though we know what's going on, it's still like magic. Sarah immediately calls Becky in because the first thing she thinks is, I've got to share this. I can't have this just for me. She calls her in and they enjoy and appreciate everything that's given to them and Sarah's not sure if it is actually magic, but she thinks somebody must have done this for me and I have to thank them. Finally, Sarah uh, ends up visiting the Indian gentleman next door, as he is called. All is revealed in the course of that conversation, what he and Ram Dass have done for her and how he knew Captain Crew, how she is the one he has been looking for and she's never going to have to worry about living in that awful attic and everything ever again. Now the gentleman calls over Miss Minchin to tell her the news and it does not go over real well. <laughs> she realizes that given her treatment of Sarah, she has no leg to stand on, can make no demands, and she's not gonna get any more money out of this little rich girl. She goes back to the school and complains to her sister. However, it proves that this whole situation has given her sister new strength. And Miss Amelia tells Miss Minchin exactly what she thinks of the entire situation. And from that moment on, Miss Minchin is a little bit in awe of her sister. She realizes that Miss Amelia is not as stupid as she thought she was and that she can't order her around like she used to. And even now, Sarah does not forget her friends. She asks for Becky to be brought and to live with her as a companion, not a servant, more like a living friend. Not only that, she remembers the little girl who she gave the rolls to, and she goes back to the shop to see if she can get more rolls and track down this little girl and give her what she needs. 
And it turns out that Sarah's generosity has paid it forward, basically. It has rubbed off. The lady who owns the roll shop and saw the whole thing brought the little girl in and gave her a home. Now, that's part of what resonates, especially as a grown-up. <laughs> when you're a kid and maybe especially a little girl, I can't say for sure because I am a cisgender woman and continue to be one. Uh, so I can't say for sure to somebody else's experience. I know that for mine and uh, for many others like me, the, that was a big thing. Yeah, you wanted to be, you wanted to have what Sarah had, but it wasn't just that. You wanted to be like her. You wanted to be kind and thoughtful of others, and you wanted other people to like you. It's a perfect book for bookworms because Sarah is a bookworm. She loves books. She loves learning. She's very sharp in many ways, and that's shown to be a good thing and to her great advantage. It also shows the power of imagination <laughs> and how well it can work for you, how a positive attitude can see you through dark times. Those are the lessons that stick with you and really stick with you through life and haven't changed in over a hundred years. Those are like basic human things, I guess. They're the things that you don't necessarily pick up on as a kid and you do when you're older. And when you're a kid, it's all more about all the cool stuff that Sarah has and all the sad stuff that happens to her. But you know it's going to get better, especially because it's a kid's book. And it does. And in such a way, the magic is what you really remember and what sticks with you. And you're like, oh, wow, that is so cool. And then you end up playing Little Princess in your room for ages and like, oh, I'm going to go to sleep. And then when I wake up, there's going to be all this cool stuff in my room. And it doesn't necessarily happen, but you can be like Sarah and harness the power of imagination and make it so. So yeah, I think those are at least some of the reasons why this book is still very popular. If there's anything I missed, you know, just Mention it down below. I mean, I just kind of re-skimmed it and was like, oh yeah, this happened. Oh yeah, that happened. It's always a treat to go back and cover all that again. Um, so yeah, just mention it down below. And um, any other books that you think really still resonate today and why, I'd love to hear from you. It was also really good to see you guys again. I'm still here. I haven't left, I promise. Um, but I'm going to go leave right now because I have another week um, until, until, well, until next week. Until next show, next episode, next video. That's the word. Yeah, uh, I, I clearly need another week to write all my thoughts down because just spitballing like this is not my strong point. In any case, I will see you next week. <laughs> Bye!